tunnel of Espalinus is a monument dedicated to the science of geometry. The tunnel manages to glorify geometry as did the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The tunnel of Espalinus is the work of a genius in geometry at the time when geometry had just made it for a celestial leap. From a theoretical point of view of the Tunnel of Palinus is a huge project because the geometric knowledge and instruments were still elementary at this time at the time it was built. The whole project was dazzled by a charismatic writer na named F. Palinus and will be mentioned in the centuries to come as one of the greatest achievements of ancient Hellenism. On the occasion of its first opening for the public and a recent visit, we actually walked the tunnel all the way as you can see, we would like to make known some facts, most of which are quite impressive, yet unknown to the many. Beyond its length, its purpose and the name of its creator, who knows for example how much money it cost, how many years it took to complete, who knows its two-edged and especially its rectilinear form and shape, the evidence and the fact cited below are based on an excellent book published by the mathematician and architect Dimitris Tsimbourakis titled 530 BC, the Tunnel of Palinius in ancient Samos. Our aim is to make known these facts to as many people as possible in order to stimulate interest and to attract more visitors. Samos has been inhabited since the ancient times and its contacts with the cultural centers of Ephesus and Miletus in the opposite Asia Minor coast have been constant and intense. Samos' contribution to geometry was through Pythagoras and Aristarchus. At the end of the 6th century BC, political authority passed to a nobleman called Polycrates who ruled the island as a tyrant from 537 to 522 BC which turned to be an era of great prosperity for the whole island. According to Herodotus, Samos under Polycrates became the first of the first among the Greek barbarians. I have written at such length of Samians because the three greatest works of all the Greeks were engineered by them. The first of these is the tunnel with a mouth at either end driven though the base of a hill 900 feet high the whole tunnel is 4200 feet long, 8 feet and 8 feet wide. And throughout the whole of its length, there runs a tunnel 30 feet deep and 3 feet wide, through which the water coming from an abundant spring carried by pipes to the city of Samos. The designer of this work was Epalinus, son of Nasrophus and Megarian. This is one of the three works. The second is a brick border in the sea enclosing the harbor sunk 120 feet and more than 1200 feet in length. The third Samian work is a temple which is greatest of all temples of which we know. Its first builder was Rocius, son of Phils, a Samian. It is for this cause that I have expounded the more than ordinary length of Samus. Herodotus, who wrote his stories some 80 years after Polycrates' death, dedicates many pages to Samos, especially during the period when the island was ruled by Polycrates. And at the end of his work, it is clearly admirably but dense when he comments on the three above mentioned projects. This confirms indirectly but clearly that these explicit projects were completed when Samos was indeed the first on, of the first among the Greek and barbarians during the year of Polycrates. The tunnel of Espalinus is a 1036 meters long tunnel, in straight line of course, built around 530 BC by the architect Espalinus from Megara. The extraordinary thing is that the excavations of the tunnel become according to one amount at the same time from two opposite sides, which met with minimal divergence. The construction lasted about 11 years. The tunnel follows a horizontal direction, a sloping grove wa was opened in the floor, in which clay pipes were placed and used to carry the fresh water to the city. From the source, the water was carried by an underground 853 meters long pipeline to the northern entrance of the tunnel and by clay pipes through the tunnel to the city. The tunnel of F. Palinus functioned as an integrated aqueduct system until the 5th century AD. 
Since then, its maintenance was neglected and eventually abandoned due to the operation and use of another ad aqueduct built by the Romans which covered the needs of the city of for fresh water. The abandoned tunnel was blocked by Dern and Stalastes and eventually collapsed after serving Samos for then 1000 years. In the 7th century AD, it was reused as a cemetery this time, but again after several centuries it was abandoned and completely forgotten. It was rediscovered in the mid 19th century. The discovery was made possible thanks to Herodotus since no one else wrote anything about the town of Ephalenius. Indeed, in 1856, the French archaeologist Garin discovered with the assistance of a local chieftain named Alexis the spring and the beginning of the tunnel. At the meeting point of, of the two opposite tunnels appear, appears a notable difference in, in direction as well as in the levels of the floor and ceilings. This differentiation shows the two-edged form of the structure. The altitudes of the two entrances clearly indicate the choice of Ephalinus to construct the two tunnels on the same horizontal plane. After the construction of the first 400 meter meters, the southern tunnel turns absorbly 34 degrees to the right and continues 30 meters more. The turn was not made at the middle of the distance, but 135 meters before. If the opening of the two opposite tunnels had been started at the same time, given the fact that the meeting point is located before the middle point, the construction of the southern tunnel would, be, would have been stopped two years earlier, something which didn't happen. Thus, it's highly speculated that the construction of, of the southern tunnel began later than the northern one. All the attempts for meeting of the two tunnels were made by the northern crew. The southern crew either waited or proceeded slowly, always producing uh, sound signals to alert the northern crew. The elevation study shows that the floor of the southern tunnel is located at an altitude of 55.70 meters, with, while the northern tunnel just before point B is located at an altitude of 55.48 meters. Thus, for more than 1000 meters, the level of the two floors remains almost completely horizontal. Shortly before point B, 27 meters before the meeting point of the two tunnels, a vertical maneuver begins at the same time with the horizontal one. It seems that F. Paulinus, while certain for the correct direction of the two tunnels, began to fear began to fear that one tunnel might pass over the other, so he decided to increase the height of the northern tunnel in order to increase the chances of winning in case the two tunnels were not complanar after all. Following the completion of the tunnel, Ephalinus began the construction of the sloping groove on the floor which would transport the water to the city. This is what Herodotus called the 20 cubits. In the northern tunnel, in the, northern tunnel the groove was located 3.5 meters below ground, while in the southern tunnel its depth reached 8.5 meters below ground. This sloping groove was built by workers who worked kneeling under ice conditions, in darkness and in abundant underwater waters. Today the view of the groove looks awesome and inspiring due to its depth and tightness. The outer southern part of the aqueduct is located 5 meters below ground and has 0.55% per gradient. Today only few remainers are preserved. In the spring area, a rectangular triangle shaped basin was created with the construction of the two vertical slides and the, and the sculpturing of the hypotenuse on the rock. Its dimensions are 7 by 5.5 meters. Inside the basin, 15 square stone columns were built on top of which were laid stone beams and on top of the beams were placed thick stone plates, so the water tank was housed and clean water was, was ensured. Today the basin is preserved exactly as it was built and its roof now serves as floor to the, for the small church of St. John. The spring still supplies fresh water carried to the city by mortar metallic tube. The water was channeled to the city by high quality clay pipes. The pipes were cylind cylindrical with 20 cm internal diameter and 3 cm thickness. The length of a single pipe was approximately 67 cm and every time a second pipe top hole 
15 cm in diameter for ventilation, easy maintenance and cleaning. Overall the tunnel took 11 years to complete. Yes, while we are grateful to Herodotus for his reference to the tunnel of Espalinus, we must reapproach him because he didn't record more details about the project, especially for the period it was constructed. So we have to accept that it was constructed when Samos accumulated wealth and enemies when the city constructed the stadium breakwater for its triremes and when the city was surrounded by a 6 km long wall during the Polycrates rule. It is speculated that the tunnel of Epalinus began construction around 534 BC and was completed around 523 BC. Polycrates was murdered in Sardis in 522 BC, so he might not have the chance to see his famous aqueduct completed. Accounting for its total cost, we have to make some risky assumptions. We accept the assumption that professional craftsmen were employed due to the precision requirements of the whole project. We also accept the assumption that the project was done in, th in three shifts per day and two shifts per day for the construction of the outer parts. The productivity of the so-called continuous worker is 2 meters per ton per month. The wage of worker was drachma per day. In total, the amount of drachmas need correspond to 222,000 wages. Given that an Athenian talent of gold weighs 22.6 kilograms and is the equivalent of 6,000 drachmas, we conclude that the total labor cost was 52 talents of gold. It should be noted that a well-known Athenian doctor was paid for his service 20 to 30 drachmas a day or about 1 to 2 talents of gold per year. The same amount was paid for a young, beautiful and adequate prostitute. We should not forget Aristotle's view that the great public works made by tyrants aimed at taxation and employment in order to secure and maintain public order and avoid possible conspiracies. In, in other words, Aristotle was convinced that the predominant concern of all tyrants was employment or low unemployment in order to maintain their tyranny. Ironically, Herodotus as a non-expert was impressed by a two-edged form of the tunnel, not by its rectangular shape, which probably ignored, ignored as he was never informed about it, despite the fact that the rectangular shape was the most amazing thing of the whole construction, and for this, Epalinius decided the most complex of all the available solutions. The tunnel of Epalinius was discovered in 1882, while its rectangular shape was acknowledged in 1884, by Fabricius. <coughs> Herodotus, in short description, does not refer to the straight line of the tunnel, although this was the most amazing of Herodotus lived for a long time in Samos, when in his hometown ruled a close friend to the Persians, the Tyrant Lake Dummies. During his stay in Samos, he surely visited and explored the tunnel which already overrated as an aqueduct for at least 60 years. With his own eyes, he must have seen the rectilinear shape with the two-edged form of, this, of the tunnel. It seems, however, that no one spoke to him about the rectilinear shape of the tunnel, or someone did it, but he questioned the information because he couldn't verify it with his own eyes. Even today, due to the complex central maneuver, the visitor is unable to acknowledge the rectilinear shape of the route, so Herodotus didn't see or didn't find the rectilinear shape of the construction. After two or three generations, this characteristic feature was forgotten. It was made known against 24 centuries later in 1884.